Good morning and welcome to ICA's online service. Before we get started, here's a few things you might want to know. Good morning and welcome to ICA. Before we get started, here's a few things you might want to know. Growth and relationship happens in small group communities. At ICA, we call those go groups. We are looking for more groups to meet the needs of people at ICA. Today, we're looking for people to host and facilitate new go groups. If you are interested in learning more about hosting a go group, join our class today at 2 p.m. at ICA East and West. Help us build community at ICA. ICA Kids is having a vacation Bible school on June 20th to 23rd from 10 a.m. to noon each day. The Babylon VBS is an interactive Bible adventure for kids grades one through six. Registration is now open, so parents, scan the QR code and sign up your child today. We are looking for volunteers to help. If you are interested in learning more about volunteering to help with this event, scan the QR code on the screen. I would like to invite you to come and join ICA 24 Hours of Worship. 24 Hours of Worship is a full day dedicated for us to worship God together here live in person from ICA West Sanctuary. We do 24 hours of worship so that you can come in any time, stay as long as you can, bring your friends and worship God together because He's worthy and He deserves all the glory and praise that we can give. Save the date. May 31st, 7 p.m. all the way to June 1st, 7 p.m. Prepare your heart. We'll see you there. Let's worship God together, seeking Him upward for the audience of one. My name is Pastor John. Welcome to ICA Online Service today. I'm glad you're joining us from wherever you're at, and I pray that God's blessing will be upon you and your family today. A couple of things we want to make you aware of. Today at 2 p.m. at ICA East and West campuses, we will have introductory classes for small group facilitators. If you're interested in leading a small group, we need you. If you want to know where to start or how it works, this is the class for you. This next week, during the holiday, we will be having the 24 hours of worship and upward service. Starting May 31st at 7 p.m., if you're looking for spiritual renewal, this is the opportunity for you. Before Jesus' ascension, he met with the disciples to give them instructions about what was about to happen. In John chapter 16, verse 5, he said, But now I am going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking me, where am I going? Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin, of God's righteousness, and of the coming judgment. Verse 12 there is so much more that I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. 
He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said, the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. Now today we're starting a new sermon series entitled War and Peace. Pentecost Sunday, which is today, is both the advent of the coming of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the church. Jesus made promises about someone who was coming to help bring peace, shalom. But Jesus also promised that this someone would come to give us power for life. Well, who is this person that Jesus promised to give us? Power and peace. Many believers are content to acknowledge the Holy Spirit, but on the level of personal encounter, the relationship has been largely with the Father and the Son. The 20th century brought a new awareness of the Holy Spirit and his ministry, followed by explosive church growth worldwide. Currently, the fastest growing churches are Pentecostal and charismatic church movements which number in the hundreds of millions of people around the world. But spirit-filled Christianity has been an essential part of spiritual formation since the very early days of the church in Acts. However, people have demonstrated this tendency toward polar opposite responses to the work of the Holy Spirit, either one of obsession or one to reject Behind rejecting the Holy Spirit lies the twin fears of experiential excess or the loss of control. Motivating the obsession is emotionalism, sensationalism, and a vulnerability to manipulation or false teachings. We need to balance both extremes with an openness to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need discernment that tests experience against the truth of Scripture. And the fruit that is produced in our lives. So today we begin this multi-week series with two simple questions today. So who is the Holy Spirit and what does he do? The Holy Spirit is a person, not an impersonal force. We have to remember that the personhood of the Holy Spirit is real. It would be wrong to think of the Holy Spirit as an it. For those of you familiar with the genre of Star Wars, there is a power called the Force that works in the lives of Jedi warriors that gives them their power. But this power comes from an impersonal force. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, is not an impersonal force like gravity. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, the work of the Holy Spirit is multifaceted. But essentially, the Holy Spirit points people to Jesus, and the Holy Spirit changes hearts, making us progressively more like Jesus Christ. The work of the Holy Spirit results in a new quality of life and purification as we submit to his control. He equips us with spiritual gifts and creates opportunities to build others up in the faith. But we must be careful not to limit the work of the Spirit to only power, purity, and performance. We must remember that the Holy Spirit is an active, personal presence in our lives. The Holy Spirit transforms our character, so we become more and more like Jesus. Jesus called the Holy Spirit the paraclete, uh, meaning the one called alongside to help. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, But I will send you the Advocate, the Spirit of Truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. The paraclete is variously translated to include the ideas of helper, comforter, counselor, advocate, intercessor, supporter, strengthener. Each of these words carries a different nuance to the work of the Holy Spirit. John 16, Jesus said, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. You know, who doesn't want the Holy Spirit of God in their lives to help, comfort, give counsel, 
to be an advocate for you, to help you pray, to support and strengthen you. The Holy Spirit or the paraclete also guides us to truth. John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. The Holy Spirit brings life transformation. He makes becoming like Christ possible. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. The scriptures use a variety of images to illustrate the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. One of the works of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit convicts believers of sin and righteousness and judgment. But let's define conviction for a moment. Conviction is to convince of guilt or prove guilty. In John 16, And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness, and of coming judgment. The scripture says that we are convicted by the Holy Spirit in three different ways, in the area of our sin, in the area of righteousness, and of judgment. The first is that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. It's like the confrontation between King David and the prophet Nathan. Nathan came before the king and laid out his sin in plain sight and and said to David, you are the man. Then in Psalm 51, we read David's response to being called out by the prophet. David knows he's guilty of sin. He's convicted of his sin, and then he responds in repentance. The Holy Spirit helps bring clarity to the sin in our lives. Uh, I remember when I was a boy, once I stole my friend's Hot Wheels truck and trailer. I felt so guilty about stealing that I returned it. You know, I've even had moments where I've said things only to feel conviction about what I had said, and then I had to go back to that person and make it right. Conviction is the first step in repentance. Conviction tells us when we've done something wrong before the Lord. Without the work of conviction, people would never realize their sin or their need to repent and find forgiveness. Second, the Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness. The Holy Spirit enforces God's holy standard of righteousness in our thoughts and our actions. In the moments of life when we are confronted by choices and opportunities, it is the Holy Spirit that tells us what is right and what is wrong, even before we make or take any action. Have you ever heard the voice of God speaking to you about what is right and what is wrong in a particular situation in your own life? That is the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit gives us certainty that judgment is coming unless we repent of our sin. When human sin is confronted by the righteousness of God, judgment always follows. William Barclay famously wrote, What makes a man feel certain that judgment lies ahead? It is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is He who gives us the inner, unshakable conviction that we shall stand before the judgment seat of God. Speaking of awareness of judgment, I remember once when I was about nine years old, my parents and I had gone to visit my oldest sister and her husband living in Seattle. One morning I got up uh, out of bed and I realized nobody was in the house. And so I went to all the rooms and checked all the beds and everything was empty. I thought the rapture had taken place And I was left behind and all alone, and I was terrified as a kid. Why? Because in part, I was convinced that God will hold all of us accountable for our deeds, like stealing your friend's Hot Wheels car. Even now as an adult, there are things that I do and other things that I don't. Why? Because I know that I will stand before God and everything about my life will be laid bare. I want that moment to be a moment of reward and joy, not judgment and shame. Remember the judgment of God is like a two-sided coin. For those who do good, the judgment seat of God doesn't hold any fear, but reward. 
For those who do wickedness and do wrong, the fear of judgment keeps us accountable to do what is right. ICA, we need to live upright, godly lives so that we receive rewards and not fear God's judgment. The Holy Spirit also regenerates us, bringing transformation. This happens as the Spirit gives us eternal life through new birth and being born again. Because of regeneration of the Spirit, our lives are transformed. Titus chapter 3, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. The regeneration of the Holy Spirit gives a new believer a new nature, born of the Spirit, a new life that is progressively transformed by the Spirit of God. One of Corey's and my closest friends is a couple that they got pregnant out of, outside of wedlock. Uh, they ran off and got married without their parents' permission while they were still in high school. Everything in their life was on a trajectory for disaster. But one day, a guy in a mall came and told them about Jesus. They accepted Christ, became followers of Jesus. Today, if you were to meet them and they were to tell you their story, you would have a hard time believing their story. Who they are today is nothing like their past history. Why? Because the work of the Holy Spirit brings regeneration and transformation. The Holy Spirit also seals us. He seals our eternal inheritance as a child of God. He seals us for our day of redemption. It's like putting a sticker on your stuff that says property of ICA. But in a spiritual sense, it's a sticker that says property of God on your life. The Holy Spirit seals or puts his identifier on you that you are God's child. Ephesians chapter 1, and now you Gentiles have also heard the truth the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. The Holy Spirit's property of God sticker on us is not just an identifier. God sealing us brings a guarantee, a, a pledge to fulfill God's promises to us and the guarantee of our eternal inheritance. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, and he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. God guaranteeing his promises to us is important because of every time we have ever asked, Lord, when will you fulfill your promises to make the wrong things right? Every time we ask God, why do the wicked succeed while the righteous get kicked in the teeth? Every time we live righteously and our reward is deferred. You know, God's seal on our lives is his guarantee that everything he promised will be fulfilled. The Holy Spirit lives in us. The Spirit of God also permanently lives in believers. Our bodies, the scripture says, are temples of the Holy Spirit living in us. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. Because the Holy Spirit indwells our bodies, we don't abuse our bodies, we don't uh, we don't degrade our bodies by our behavior. We don't use our bodies for unholy purposes. Why? Well, because we are the temple, the dwelling place of the spirit and presence of God. This is why we don't believe in like self-mutilation and cutting and self-abuse. Because this is the abuse of God's temple, the place where God's spirit resides in us. We need to treat our bodies with respect as God's temple. Additionally, what motivates the Christian toward health and fitness should not be just narcissistic love of self. Rather, it is also motivated by a love for God and respect for the physical temple that God has given us, our bodies. 
the Holy Spirit also fills us. When we were filled with the Holy Spirit, we are controlled by the Spirit, producing joy and praise in our hearts and in our lives. Ephesians 5, don't be drunk on wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. When we are full of the Holy Spirit, we experience a merriment and a joy in our lives. We don't require drugs or alcohol to feel good. You know, we can have a sense of well-being and joy that is outside of our circumstances. I think I told this story once before of my first car, 1978 Pontiac Firebird. Over a period of time, I rebuilt that car. I rebuilt the motor. I had it repainted. Uh, one day while I was in college, it caught fire while I was driving down the road. Uh, it was caused by an electrical short, and all I had to do was stop the, to stop the fire was turn off the car and disconnect the battery. But unfortunately, I'd loaned out my tools the night before, so I couldn't disconnect the battery, and the car burned up. I remember calling my dad. He asked me how I was doing. I said, Dad, I can't really explain it, but I have a sense of joy. I feel completely at peace. I have a sense that everything is going to be okay. Well, why? Well, that's because the Holy Spirit fills us with joy and praise when circumstances are even painful. Another thing, the Holy Spirit fills us with the fruit of the Spirit. That's in Galatians chapter 5, but we're going to save that topic for another week. The Holy Spirit also empowers us. There are two other aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit. He provides power for ministry in our words and our deeds, and he empowers us to confront evil. In Acts chapter 4, verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Now, how was Peter able to speak truth to power and confront the enemies of the gospel? Well, it was through the power of the Holy Spirit. A, a number of years ago, I was asked to do a high-profile funeral, both in Surabaya and also in Singapore. The presidents and vice presidents and board members of international energy and, and industry companies were going to be there. Top executives from PLN, Alstom, Shell Oil, high-profile international law firms were going to be there. I remember asking, God, how do I speak to this kind of people? And all I could tell you was that in the moment I felt an empowerment of the Holy Spirit, I had a clarity and confidence about the truth of what I was saying, and there was a boldness and empowerment to the gospel as I shared at those funerals. Matter of fact, after the funeral, one of these executives came up to me afterwards and said that he was thinking about accepting Christ. Well, how does that happen at a funeral? Well, it is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 13, verse 9, Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. Then he said, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. Paul was able to confront and prevail over evil through the power of the Holy Spirit. I remember one time when I was attending my own church youth group back when I was young. Uh, we had a situation in our service where one of the students began to demonstrate demonic possession. And during the worship, the student fell on the floor and began writhing and contorting his body. Uh, his eyes went wild and then rolled back into his head. And then he began speaking in a voice that, I mean, I knew this guy and I'd never heard that before. 
Of course, the service stopped at that point. Our youth pastor began to lead us in prayer for this student. The demon told us to stop praying for this student because he owned him. And then he started threatening us. There was a level of fear in the room that began to rise. And then the demon said that we should run away and leave him alone because it was calling for more demons to come and join the fight. Our our praying got really quiet, you know, the praying in the room uh, because of fear. And then something came over me as a 17-year-old kid who had recently given his heart to the Lord. I believe it was the power of the Holy Spirit. And before I could even think about what I was saying, I blurted out, you tell those demons to hurry up because we are going to wait for them because Jesus is going to kick their butts too. The power of the Holy Spirit changed the atmosphere in the room. Courage and confidence arose in the hearts of just teenage students. They prayed for their friend and that student was set free that night. Why? Because the Holy Spirit gives us power to confront and to overcome evil. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to confront evil in the world in which we live. The Holy Spirit also teaches and guides us. Jesus promised that the Spirit of truth would guide you into all truth and to tell you about the future in John 16. John also wrote, For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know, and what he teaches is true. It is not a lie. The Holy Spirit both teaches us and guides our lives. I was thinking about this as I was writing the message about how God has taught me and guided my life over the years from the beginning until now. The Holy Spirit spoke to me as an 18-year-old that I was going to be a preacher. And two seconds later, the Holy Spirit spoke to the pastor leading the service. He steps up to the mic and announces that God was calling me to be a preacher at that very moment. He had no idea what the Holy Spirit was saying in my head, but the Holy Spirit guided me and guided him. The Holy Spirit guided me to my career on the railroad through a Christian boss. There I learned about being persecuted for my faith and the cost of discipleship. The Holy Spirit guided me to leave that career at the exact right time. Holy Spirit guided me to my next job where I would meet my future wife. Holy Spirit taught me to give to missions on a monthly basis while I was in college, teaching me to trust God's system of economics. The Holy Spirit guided my senior pastor to put me in charge of missions, where all of a sudden I had to interact with all the missionaries and listen to what they had to say. The Holy Spirit guided me to leave that church and go back to to university. The Holy Spirit guided us away Corey and I, from being missionaries in Croatia or Bosnia because God had a different plan. The Holy Spirit guided the people who invited Corey and I to Indonesia, guided my pastor to change his sermon and preach on risky obedience on the very weekend that Corey and I were fasting and praying about the decision to come to Indonesia or not. We went to Wesley School where we taught and served as campus pastors, a school out of which would come three of ICA's future pastors, Pastor Daniel and Eva Tanusaputra, Pastor Leighton Gallagher, and now Pastor Samuel Hahn. That was directed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided Jeff and Liz to invite Corey and I to come and join them in ministry here at ICA. The Holy Spirit spoke to my wife that God was calling us to Indonesia. Nine months later, the Holy Spirit spoke to me during ICA Missions Convention that we were to make a lifetime commitment to Indonesia. The Holy Spirit guided us away from working in northern Sumatra back to working with ICA to become ICA's East Campus pastor and later lead pastor. Again, that was the Holy Spirit that led my wife to teach where she teaches today and where my kids go to school. It was the Holy Spirit that spoke to me in the middle of the night after an earthquake on Sumba and again the next day on an airplane to Bali about what God was doing on the island of Sumba and that God was calling me to be a part of it. It was the Holy Spirit this past week that prompted me to go to a lunch after a funeral where I would meet a young man who was asking questions 
about God's plan for his life. Until today, I can tell you that the Holy Spirit has been the essential element to determine our family and my life's direction. This power of the Holy Spirit to direct our lives is available for all believers. ICA, we need everything that the Holy Spirit offers. Now, after Jesus' resurrection, before his ascension, Jesus commanded his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4, once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So the disciples did, you know, what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1. And after Jesus' ascension, the disciples went back into Jerusalem where they waited in an upper room. There were about 120 of them on that Pentecost Sunday. They replaced Judas with another apostle, Matthias. And finally, on Pentecost Sunday, Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then, what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages, as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now, this miraculous event drew a crowd. You know, some thought they were drunk or crazy. You know, others wondered what, you know, this could mean. Um, Peter, now filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, stands up to address the crowd. And he preached a simple sermon, really, that basically could be summarized as, Jesus is the Son of God. His miracles and resurrection proved his identity. You killed him. Repent of your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. And that day, 3,000 people accepted Christ. And this event on Pentecost Sunday is the advent or the coming of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit being poured out on believers. It's also the birthday of the church. This is what we celebrate today on Pentecost Sunday. Now, I want to make a connection between the Holy Spirit in Acts and the 24 hours of worship. 24 hours of worship is more than just our sacrifice of praise to God. This service is tied to our theme for the year, inward, outward, and upward. We want God to work in all three directions in our lives. On June 1st, we're going to have an upward service during our final two hours of the 24 hours of worship. We will pray for people who are looking for spiritual renewal and are hungry for God, We'll pray for you who are wanting more of the power of the Holy Spirit in your lives. And if you're looking for God to ignite or reignite your spiritual life, the 24 hours of worship is for you. I want to encourage you to come and give something to the Lord in your worship and then receive something from Him as well. Jesus talked about this idea of waiting on God for His power. Jesus told the disciples to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit that would come, that he would bring to their lives. There was a time of worship and reflection in the upper room between when Jesus said the Holy Spirit would come and when he finally came. They waited on God in a similar way. I'm asking you to spend this week waiting, reflecting, and seeking the power of the Holy Spirit in your own lives. We need everything that the Holy Spirit offers the believer. And we're believing God for people to receive the power of the Holy Spirit during the 24 hours of worship. I want to encourage you to come. Now let's pray. Lord, we need the paraclete, the one who comes alongside the Holy Spirit to come and help us. We need the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. We need the Holy Spirit to bring regeneration and transformation in our lives. Lord, we're asking for your Holy Spirit to fill us, to empower us in our words and in our action. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to confront the evil that we see 
in our own lives, Lord, in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces. God, we need the Holy Spirit to teach us how to live and to guide our lives into the future. We need your Holy Spirit to use us to point people to Jesus. Lord, we want everything that the scriptures say that the Holy Spirit accomplishes in our lives. Lord, you said that the Holy Spirit would come after you left to help us. Lord, we need that help. God, this week, would you help us as we commit ourselves to waiting on you for the gift of the Holy Spirit and the power that he offers to be made real in our lives. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to ask that you raise your hands and receive the benediction today uh, before you go. It's a blessing I just want to pray over you. It comes from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It says this, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord do all of these things in your lives this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you for coming and joining us to on, our, on our online service. We'll see you next week. And we'll see you at the 24 Hours of Worship. Thank you for joining us today at ICA Online. We hope you had a great Sunday and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Growth and relationship happens in small group communities. At ICA, we call those Go Groups. We are looking for more groups to meet the needs of people at ICA. Today, we're looking for people to host and facilitate new Go Groups. If you are interested in learning more about hosting a Go Group, join our class today at 2 p.m. at ICA East and West. Help us build community at ICA. ICA 24-hour worship is happening May 31st to June 1st. We will be gathering to worship God for 24 hours in a row at ICA West. Come join us and stay as long as you like and let's seek God upward together. ICA Kids is having a vacation Bible school on June 20th to 23rd from 10 a.m. to noon each day. The Babylon VBS is an interactive Bible adventure for kids grades one through six. Registration is now open so parents scan the QR code and sign up your child today. We are looking for volunteers to help. If you are interested in learning more about volunteering to help with this event, scan the QR code on the screen. ICA is looking for volunteers to help us with our service media ministry. This includes service directors, lighting and sound, and LCD operators. We are also looking for help with worship in the West and hospitality in the East. Check the QR code to see other opportunities and sign up to start serving at ICA. Small groups are the best way to get connected and meet people at ICA. If you are not yet part of a small group, visit our website or the Church Center app and check out what group might be right for you to join. And sign up and get connected today. Giving to the ministry at ICA is easier than ever. Just scan the QR code of your mobile banking app or enter the account number on screen to make a transfer. Your generosity is what makes the ministry at ICA possible. If you need prayer, we want to pray together with you. Visit bit.ly forward slash ICA prayer online and let's believe God together for a breakthrough in your life. ICA online prayer service happens every Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. Check our social media on Tuesdays for the Zoom link information and gather with us to worship and pray together. ICA has services every Sunday in person and online on our YouTube channel at ICA Surabaya. Service times at our West Campus and online are at 8 a.m. for Bahasa and 10 a.m. for English. At our East Campus, our Bahasa service is at 8 a.m. and our English services are at 9.15 and 11 a.m. Join us each Sunday to worship and grow together. Follow ICA social media on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Spotify. There you will find important information, devotions, playlists, and interesting content and updates for you.